The second question that I've been asked to address this morning is like unto the first. Can we trust the Bible over the Quran? And again, my answer to that question will come as no surprise to anyone in this room. Yes, we can. What you really want to hear from me, so I assume, is an explanation of why. Again, why can we trust the Bible over the Quran? And this question, can we trust the Bible over the Quran, has the same basic form as the one we dealt with earlier. It's a can we trust X over Y question. And therefore, much of what I said earlier applies here too, about how we approach these questions, about whether we take an evidentialist approach, about what's the basis for the, our trust in the Bible. So uh, I'm taking for granted quite a bit of what I've already shared with you this morning. So these questions are similar. However, there is a significant difference between the earlier question and this one that we're dealing with now. And the difference is that while many Christians are troubled by the challenge of evolutionary science, not many at all are troubled by the challenge of the Quran. Now, they may be, challenged, uh, they may be troubled by the challenge of Islam, uh, as a, a religious phenomenon in the world. Of course, that's a different issue. Uh, here we're thinking specifically of the Quran. What I mean then is that there are some Christians who encounter the claims of evolutionary scientists or they read books on evolution and their trust in the Bible is shaken. But I've never come across a person who actually read the Bible all the way through, who understood and accepted its message but who then read the Quran and concluded that the Quran was more trustworthy than the Bible. In fact, if you haven't read the Quran, I would encourage you to do so, or at least to read some significant parts of it, maybe the first nine or ten chapters, which are pretty representative. It gets a little repetitive, um, actually. It says the same things over and over. You have absolutely nothing to fear from doing that. In fact, I'm very confident that your trust in the Bible will only increase as a result of doing that, comparing it alongside the Quran. So my point here is that the Quran doesn't really present a problem for well-informed, Bible-believing Christians. At least it's, it's very unlikely that it would. However, there are two reasons why this is still a question worth addressing. First, God may give us opportunity to witness to Muslims who do trust the Quran over the Bible, and we should be able to explain why our position is more reasonable than theirs. And secondly, there are many unbelievers out there who have no particular religious faith, they don't believe the Bible or the Quran, and they hold the naive view that all religions are basically the same, and that one might just as well be a Muslim as a Christian. And we need to be able to explain to them why this is not the case, why the Bible should be seen as more trustworthy than the Quran. All religions are not equal. Here's a roadmap for my talk. The structure of it is a little simpler than the one uh, I gave earlier. Uh, really three sections to it. First, I'm going to give a very basic overview of the religion of Islam to give the broader context for what I'm going to say about the Quran. Secondly, I'll give an overview of the Quran itself, uh, some basic facts about the book, and a summary of what Muslims actually believe and claim about the Quran. And thirdly, I'm going to give three reasons why we shouldn't trust the Quran over the Bible, and neither should anyone else. And that will be the main, the meat of the talk. Okay? So beginning first with a, an overview of Islam. Islam is the second largest world religion today, accounting for over 20% of the world population. In other words, more than one-fifth of the world population identifies with Islam. According to some estimates, it's closer to one-quarter. Either way, it's fairly safe to say that Islam will reach 25% of the world population in the next few decades, based on current um, rates of increase. In contrast, Christianity, broadly defined, 
accounts for around one-third of the world population identifying themselves as Christian. As we know, there's a lot of variation within that. Islam is also one of the fastest-growing religions in the United States. By some estimates, it is the fastest-growing religion in the United States. Uh, the only thing that really compares with it is Mormonism in terms of growth rates. According to the 2010 U.S. religion census, there are 2.6 million Muslims living in the United States today. That is an increase of 1 million since the year 2000. In other words, it's increased by around, uh, the, uh, the number of Muslims has increased by around 60% since 2000, year 2000. Now, admittedly, in terms of percentages, that's only 0.8% of a percent of the U.S. population, less than 1%. But the estimated growth rate of Islam in the U.S. is between 4 and 6%. And this increase is primarily due to immigration and births rather than conversions. 14% of legal immigrants to the United States each year are Muslims. I'm not making any political point here. Please don't take it as such. Uh, I'm just stating some basic statistical facts about the presence of Islam in the United States today. Here's another striking statistic. The number of mosques in the United States has nearly doubled since 9-11. Isn't that interesting? On average, one new mosque opens every week in the United States. And so the challenge of Islam isn't something that American Christians can ignore. It's not something that's just going on in other parts of the world. More and more of our neighbors are Muslims. In fact, in my case, that is literally true. My next-door neighbors in Charlotte are Muslims. And let me tell you, they're very good neighbors. Very good. We get on extremely well. But there they are, living in the very next house. So much for the demographic, uh, demographics. Uh, what about the religion of Islam itself? Well, historically, Islam has its origins in the se early 7th century AD. Uh, so that's around 600 years after Christ. Geographically, of course, it began in the Arabian Peninsula, focused particularly on two cities, Mecca and Medina, those are the two key cities in, in the early history of Islam. The founder of Islam, as we all know, was a man by the name of Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Abdallah, to give him his full name. Uh, ibn Abdallah um, means son of the servant of Allah. His father was Abdallah, servant of Allah, uh, showing that the term Allah was actually being used uh, even before uh, Muhammad's birth. However, Muslims would not consider Muhammad to be the founder of Islam. They would say that Islam is actually the, the religion, uh, the original religion, and Muhammad uh, really just brought back this original religion. The foundational scriptures of Islam are found, of course, in the Quran, and obviously the Quran is going to be our focus here, so I'll say more about the Quran in just a moment. But what about the teachings? of Islam. What do Muslims actually believe? Well, it turns out there's a great deal of diversity with, within Islam, both in doctrine and in practice. And it's important to recognize and acknowledge that diversity. I mean, think about the diversity within Christianity. Someone says, I'm a Christian. Well, that can mean a lot of things. It's quite diverse. You're Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant, Baptist, Presbyterian. There's, that sort of diversity also exists within Islam. It is not homogeneous by any stretch of the imagination. However, despite this diversity, uh, there is a core, a core unity, a core uh, set of beliefs. Traditional Islam affirms that there are five core beliefs, and, and here they are. First, there's belief in God, Allah, to use the Arabic term. And now this isn't just theism, belief in God, it's a very strict Unitarian monotheism. Okay? Uh, God is understood to be an absolutely singular unity. The oneness of God in Islam is often set in opposition to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. We hold to a Trinitarian 
monotheism. This is a Unitarian monotheism. Often, Islam in the Quran is contrasted with the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, or, as we'll see, actually a distortion of that doctrine. And the greatest sin in Islam, indeed it's the one unforgivable sin, is the sin of shirk. Shirk is the blasphemy of associating partners with Allah. It basically covers idolatry, worshipping other gods, and polytheism. Polytheism is to worship multiple gods, worship other gods alongside Allah. Now that would be the unforgivable sin of shirk, to join partners with God. That's the one unforgivable sin. Second belief is a belief in the angels. Uh, angels in Islam are understood in a very similar way as they're understood in Jewish and Christian tradition. Uh, in Islam, angels uh, primarily as messengers. For example, the angel Gabriel, we're told, appeared to Muhammad and delivered the Quran to him, spoke the Quran to him. Third is belief in the books. Belief in the books. Islam claims to be a revealed religion. And it teaches that there are divinely inspired scriptures. The Quran is one of them. But it isn't the only scripture that Islam recognizes, at least in principle. There were other inspired books prior to the Quran. And the Quran mentions some of them by name. The Torah, first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, and the Gospel, the Quran refers to the Gospel, the Injil, as it is called in Arabic. And it seems to affirm um, the Psalms as well. It refers to a book given to David. Now this point, that there are other books recognized by Islam, is going to play an important role in my critique later on. So uh, take note of that. But each of these divinely given books comes through one of Allah's messengers. But the Quran enjoys a very special status as the last and definitive revelation from Allah. That's why it gets all the attention. So third is belief in the books. Fourth is belief in the prophets and messengers. Islam makes a distinction between prophets and messengers. Exactly what that distinction comes to isn't entirely clear. But generally speaking, a prophet is anyone who delivers a revelation from Allah. So there's, there's a larger number of prophets than there are messengers. A messenger is a special kind of a prophet. All messengers are prophets, not all prophets are messengers. A messenger is a special kind of prophet. Um, the Arabic word rasul is often translated into English as apostle. So some, some translations of the, uh, of the Quran speak of Muhammad as an apostle. Okay? And the basic idea seems to be that a messenger or an apostle is given a book and, this, and he is sent to a particular people group with this book. So uh, Moses receives a book and, uh, for the Israelites and Muhammad receives a book for the Arabs, although it turns out actually this book is for everyone else as well, but primarily for the Arabs. And the Quran appears to name 25 prophets, uh, 21 of whom are found in the Bible, the biblical prophets. But only nine of these prophets are described as messengers. And they include Noah, Lot, Ishmael, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Okay? And then the fifth belief, core belief, is belief in the resurrection and the judgment. In keeping with Judaism and Christianity, Islam teaches that there will be a final day of judgment when the dead will be raised and everyone will receive reward or punishment according to their deeds. But judgment in Islam is clearly on the basis of both faith and works. You must have faith in Allah and his messenger, but you must also have done good works in order to enter paradise. And this idea of the final judgment, a day of reckoning, was a central part of Muhammad's message that he brought to the pagan uh, polytheistic Arabs of his day. So these are the core teachings of Islam. 
Now, many would say that Islam is, is more a religion of orthopraxy than orthodoxy. It's more concerned with right practice than right doctrine. And you've maybe also heard of the five pillars of Islam. Five pillars of Islam, uh, a basic profession of faith known as the Shahada. Uh, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Uh, prayer, almsgiving, giving uh, to support the poor, fasting, and the pilgrimage. Uh, these are the five pillars of Islam that uh, all faithful Muslims need to observe. And typically these practices are treated as even more central to Islam than its theological teachings. But we don't need to explore them in detail here because our focus is specifically on the claim that the Quran is the word of God. So if this were a different kind of lecture, we could talk about practices. But our focus here is on, on um, Muslim beliefs about the Quran. Well, so much for uh, Islam as a religion. Here are some basic facts about the Quran. These are non-controversial facts, okay, facts that are generally recognized. First, the word Quran literally means recitation. Recitation. According to Islamic tradition, it was originally given by oral recitation. The angel Gabriel recited it to Muhammad, and he was instru instructed to recite it back and then to recite it to others. The Quran was originally written in Arabic, which is a Semitic language, so it's closely related to Hebrew and Aramaic. Uh, the Quran has been translated into other languages, including English, but uh, Muslims insist that these translations aren't really the Quran. Rather, they are just interpretations of the Quran. For a strict Muslim, the Quran is essentially Arabic. It has to be in Arabic language. The Quran is divided into 114 chapters, known as surahs, of varying length, some, some very long, uh, some very short. The chapters are divided into verses, but there's no official versification. There's some standard ones that most, most will use today, but there's no official versification. Uh, it has around uh, 6,200 verses in total. Contrast that with 8,000 in the New Testament. 8,000 verses in the New Testament, around 6,200 in the Quran. So the Quran is approximately three quarters the length of the New Testament. And its chapters are arranged in order of length rather than chronologically or topically. The longer chapters are at the beginning, generally, the shorter chapters towards the end. There's one exception, the first chapter is a, is a very short one. But this arrangement is one of the reasons why the Quran is so very difficult to read and to understand without some external guidance. It's not put in any logical or chronological order. And yet the order is considered to be very important if you're a Muslim. The order is part of what has been divinely given. Well, those are some basic facts about the Quran. What about the content? What about the content of the Quran? What does it actually talk about? Well, it makes reference to numerous biblical figures and events. It would be familiar to you as readers of the Bible. Uh, some of the biblical figures include Adam and Eve, although Eve is not named, uh, given by name, not referred to by name, simply as the, the woman. Uh, in fact, interestingly, there's only one woman mentioned by name in the Quran, and that is Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. Uh, but other biblical figures include Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, Job, Abraham, Lot, Joseph, Moses, Naaron, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, John the Baptist, Mary, and Jesus, all there. Quite strikingly, however, the Quran makes no specific mention of any of Jesus' apostles. No mention of Peter, James, John, or Paul, for example. We will take note of that again later on. Biblical events mentioned in the Quran include the creation of Adam, the fall of Adam, Noah and the great flood, Abraham's sacrifice of his son, although in Muslim tradition uh, it was Ishmael rather than Isaac, whom Abraham was called to sacrifice, uh, the destruction of Sodom, the story of Joseph, the patriarch, the uh, birth and calling of Moses, the exodus from Egypt, David and Goliath, Jonah and the great fish, the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus, all biblical events mentioned in the Quran. However, while they are mentioned in the Quran, they're often told quite differently. 
key elements in the biblical accounts are either changed or omitted. And the stories, as they are told in the Quran, all serve the purpose of justifying Muhammad's message. Uh, the basic message that he's a, he's a true prophet in the line of the previous prophets and that his message is resisted by wicked unbelievers in the same way as these previous prophets. What's more, some of the differences in the Quran are quite striking and they amount to outright contradictions with the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this is an, another point that we will return to later on. So those are some basic facts about the form, the structure of the Quran and, the, and its content. But what do Muslims claim about the Quran? Well, here's some uh, standard mainstream Muslim claims about the Quran. There's quite a few, so I had to reduce the font size on the screen. I hope you can still read it. First, they claim that the Quran contains the literal words of Allah. It was not authored by any human beings. So there's a contrast here with the way they viewed uh, inspiration, divine inspiration than we do. We would say that the Bible was written by human beings. The Gospels written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John for example, the epistles of Paul um, is divinely inspired. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate author of scripture but there are human authors as well in a secondary role. Not so with the Quran. The Quran is understood to be only the words of Allah. Muslims do not believe that Muhammad wrote the Quran. He received it but he did not write it. Everything in the Quran is directly spoken by Allah. Second, this Quran is taken to have been divinely revealed from a heavenly original which has eternally existed with Allah in heaven. Uh, let me read uh, one verse from the Quran. This is from Surah 85. This is truly a glorious Quran written on a preserved tablet. Preserved tablet. And Muslims understand that to be a tablet. Um, an eternal tablet existing in heaven with, with Allah. Strictly speaking, the Quran cannot be translated into other languages, as I noted a moment ago. Ideally, it should be read and recited only in the original Arabic, whether you understand it or not. And so Muslims will memorize, many Muslims for whom Arabic is not their native tongue, will memorize the Quran in Arabic, reciting it without actually understanding what it is saying, because the Arabic is so important. Translations from the Arabic are merely transliterations, they would say, or interpretations. They're not actually the Quran. And since the Quran is the word of Allah, it is held to be literally divine. It is uncreated and co-eternal with Allah. And that is why physical copies of the Quran are regarded as sacred. Um, some people naively think that, that the counterpart to Jesus in Islam is Muhammad. Not really. If anything, the counterpart to Jesus in Islam is the Quran. It is a, a copy of the Quran is, as it were, the incarnate word of God. And so you understand why all this, there's all this fuss when copies of the Quran are treated carelessly or destroyed and so forth. The Quran is considered to be the supreme miracle of Islam, both in its revelation and in its literary qualities. The way that it was revealed was a miracle and its actual uh, structure and content and poetic qualities are, are deemed to be miraculous. It is considered to be incomparable and inimitable. That is to say, no one could write anything like the Quran. And the Quran itself sets this challenge to set forth a surah like it, you know, write something that is like, like the Quran. You won't be able to do it, is the implication. The Quran is regarded as the supreme infallible authority for Muslims and by extension for all mankind. It's not as though Muslims think that uh, non-Muslims don't need to pay attention to the Quran. They believe that it is the word of God actually to, to everyone and so it's supremely authoritative. And they believe that this Quran was revealed to Muhammad over the course of 22 years, roughly uh, the year 610 AD to 632 uh, which is when Muhammad died. And it was originally revealed over two periods, known as the Meccan period and the Medinan period, after these two cities. Uh, first, Muhammad was in Mecca. He got driven out um, in, in what is called the Hijra, which is the flight from Mecca to Medina. And then he set up uh, a sort of Muslim community and eventually took over Medina. And there were revelations in that period as well. And actually the, the difference between the surahs of each period is quite striking in the way that they approach things like Christians and Jews 
and matters of war. But it was revealed, Muslims believe, over the course of 22 years to Muhammad. It was originally delivered, they would say, orally, and it was memorized by Muhammad and his followers. It wasn't originally written down. It was just recited and memorized. But it was later written down as a single book after Muhammad's death during the caliphate, uh, the rule of Abu Bakr, who was the immediate successor to Muhammad as the leader of the Muslim community. And Muslims believe that uh, since it has been written down, it has been perfectly preserved, absolutely perfectly preserved, without change or corruption since then. There's no, all the manuscripts, as it has been copied, there's been no changes, no differences, all the way down from its original writing. And this is part of the supposed miracle of the Quran, that Allah has perfectly preserved it for us today. And the basic message of the Quran is very simple. There's a lot in the Quran, but the basic message is very simple. Submit to Allah and to his prophet Muhammad in faith and obedience to the law of Allah, and you will be rewarded with paradise on the day of judgment. Well, I hope we have now a basic understanding of Islam and the Muslim view of the Quran. So now we can return to our original question. Can we trust the Bible over the Quran? I want to give three basic reasons why we shouldn't trust the Quran over the Bible. First, because it isn't realistic about the human condition. Second, because it misunderstands and misrepresents what Christians believe. And third, because it undermines itself by both affirming and contradicting earlier scriptures. Those are my three basic reasons, and I'll say a little bit about all three of them in order. So, to begin with the first reason. The Quran isn't realistic about the human condition. The Bible is very honest about the fallenness of human beings. One might say it's brutally honest. Indeed, that's why so many people don't like the Bible. The Bible tells us that we aren't basically good. We aren't even morally neutral, neither good nor evil, able to go either way. No, the Bible tells us that we are basically bad, very bad. Genesis tells us that the first man, Adam, sinned and brought corruption on the whole human race so that by the time of Noah, Genesis 6, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Uh, that's not a great report. And this grim assessment of the human condition continues right through the rest of the Bible. In Romans chapter 3, Paul pulls together a number of Old Testament texts. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's all humanity. Not just the non-Jews, the Jews as well. It's part of Paul's argument. And the Bible locates the heart of the problem as the problem of the heart. At the root of all sin is the corruption of the human heart. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Luke 16, verse 9. Our Lord Jesus speaking. Uh, verse 19. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of, the evil, out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Matthew 15, 18 and 19. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. And this corruption, this radical heart corruption, isn't something that we develop over the course of our lives. No, it's present from birth. In fact, even before birth. 
Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And it is precisely because of this radical corruption that God has to provide a radical solution. Because we are bent toward evil, slaves to sin, we cannot save ourselves. We cannot fulfill God's righteous demands. We cannot do any good works that would earn our salvation. Isaiah 64, verse 6, even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And so instead, we need two things. We need an atoning sacrifice to take away the guilt of our sin and to restore our relationship with God. And that sacrifice God has provided through his own son. And secondly, we need to be supernaturally transformed from the inside out. We need to have our hearts changed, renewed, healed. And God has provided through for that through the work of his Holy Spirit in dwelling those who have trusted in Christ. That is the biblical assessment of the human condition. Radical corruption requiring a radical, supernatural, external solution. And it resonates with what we see out there in the world, and it resonates with what we find in our own hearts when we give them an honest examination. But the picture that the Quran paints is very different. The Quran teaches that Adam did indeed sin... But that sin had no deep, lasting consequences for the human race. At worst, Adam set the rest of us a bad example. The Quran has no doctrine of original sin. It has no doctrine of human depravity. It implies that we are born into a neutral state, actually that we are born into a state of basic faith and obedience. Muslims believe that we are, everyone is born Muslims, but we're led astray by outside influences. And that's why some people become Christians and Jews and other religions. By nature, according to the teachings of Islam, we are able to do either good or evil. We have the natural capacity to know the law of God and to keep the law of God in our own strength and thereby to merit admission into paradise. In short, the Quran paints quite an optimistic picture of our basic condition and our ability to save ourselves and to live lives pleasing to God. There is no suggestion that we struggle daily, indeed every moment of every day, with a deep propensity towards sin and rebellion and self-centeredness. There is no suggestion that we need to be radically transformed and healed at the very root of our being by a supernatural work of God. And this unrealistic picture of humankind in the Quran is particularly evident in the way that it depicts the prophets. You see, in the Bible, the prophets are depicted warts and all, to use Cromwell's famous expression. Noah, Abraham, Moses, David... Elijah, Jonah, Jeremiah, although they are examples to us in many ways, they're depicted as very flawed men, weak, failing, often disappointing. And that's one reason why Jesus presents such a stark contrast in the New Testament. But the Quran's presentation of the prophets is a whitewashed one. And this is nowhere more evident in its depiction of Muhammad, who, though all although he's a, a mere human, is presented as, in effect, a flawless example. That is how he's seen by Muslims. Muhammad, no errors, no mistakes, no sins. You should follow his example. The Quran gives us not the slightest indication that Muhammad personally wrestled with sin in the way that, for example, the Apostle Paul describes so vividly in Romans 7. If I can put it bluntly, Insofar as the Quran tells any kind of story at all, it reads as a rather idealized superhero story. There are the good guys on the one side, the Muslims. And then there are the bad guys on the other side, the non-Muslims. And the good guys are led to victory by a flawlessly heroic leader, Muhammad. Contrast that with the Bible story. 
in which even the good guys aren't really good guys. The Bible has its flawless hero, of course, but he's flawless only because he is no mere man at all, but God incarnate. So my point is simply this. The Bible paints an honest, unvarnished, realistic picture of the human condition. One that we can relate to both observationally and existentially, but the Quran does not. The Quran radically underestimates the seriousness and pervasiveness of human sin. And that is exactly what we would expect if it were written by a mere man. But if the Quran underestimates the problem, why should we trust it for the solution? If it doesn't give an accurate diagnosis, why should we trust its prescription? So that's my first reason, uh, that the Quran uh, is not realistic about the human condition. Here's the second reason why I think we should not trust the Quran. And that is that the Quran misunderstands and misrepresents what Christians believe. The Quran has quite a bit to say about Jesus, about Christians, and about Christianity, uh, just as it has quite a few things to say about Jews and Judaism and their practices and beliefs. And what it says is, by and large, polemical, criticizing and contradicting various Christian teachings where they come into conflict with the message of Muhammad. One of the main points that it contests is the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. The Quran affirms that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, it affirms the virgin birth, and affirms that Jesus was a prophet, it calls him the Messiah, and it says that he was sinless, at least it implies that he was sinless. But it vehemently denounces as absurd and blasphemous the idea that Jesus is the divine Son of God who should be worshipped. Now this in itself is, is not surprising. Uh, it's not surprising that the Quran criticizes Christians and tries to refute their claims. If the Quran agreed with everything that Christians believe, Islam would just be Christianity. So of course, there's going to be conflicts. What is significant, however, is that the Quran clearly misunderstands and misrepresents some of the core teachings of Christianity, specifically the doctrine of the Trinity. And I want to read to you some of the most significant texts that we find in the Quran. Consider this first one, the, the reference at the bottom, the Q is for Quran, uh, 5 is the chapter number, 72, 73 are the, um, are the verse numbers. This is what it says. Those who say God is the Messiah, son of Mary, have defied God. The Messiah himself said, children of Israel, worship God, my Lord and your Lord. In other words, don't worship me. If anyone associates others with God, God will forbid him from the garden and hell will be his home. No one will help such evil doers. Uh, those people who say that God is the third of three are defying the truth. There is only one God. If they persist in what they are saying, a painful punishment will afflict those of them who persist. See what it's saying? It's saying that Christians believe that God is a third, that Allah is just one among three gods that they worship. And it's trying to contradict that by saying there's only one God, as if Christians don't believe that. This is a couple of verses from later on in Surah 5. When God says, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to people, take me and my mother as two gods alongside God, he will say, may you be exalted. I would never say what I had no right to say. If I had said such a thing, you would have known it. You know all that is within me, though I do not know what is within you. You alone have full knowledge of all things unseen. I told them only what you commanded me to worship God, my Lord and your Lord. Same idea here. Christians are depicted as adding two other gods to God. And who are they? Jesus and Mary. That's the Christian trinity. How the Quran presents Christian trinity. Uh, God plus Jesus plus Mary. It's three gods. Two gods alongside God. And so it seems to say that Christians are committing this uh, sin of shirk, of adding other partners to God, denying monotheism. From Surah 9, the Jews said, 
Ezra is the son of God. I don't know where it gets that from, but anyway. The Jews said Ezra is the son of God, and the Christians said the Messiah is the son of God. They said this with their own mouths, repeating what earlier disbelievers had said. May God confound them, how far astray they have been led. They take their rabbis and their monks as Lord, as well as Christ, the son of Mary, but they were commanded to serve only one God. There is no God but him. He is far above what they set up as his partners. You see the same implication here. The Christians are adding other gods to God. And Jesus is one of those gods. So it seems clear that the author of the Quran mistakenly thought that Christians worshipped multiple gods. That Christians aren't monotheists. Believe that there is just one God. Now some have suggested that what the Quran means to criticize is not orthodox Christianity, but rather heretical distortions of Christianity, which Muhammad encountered, and he may well have done. I mean, historically it's very plausible that Muhammad would have encountered some uh, unorthodox Christian beliefs. But there are several problems with that suggestion that that's what the Quran is directing itself to. First, these texts give no indication that the claims being criticized are not regarded as mainstream Orthodox Christianity. This is, this is what is said about Christians in general. And secondly, if these texts are only addressing distortions of Christianity, why doesn't the Quran also address Orthodox Christianity? Why is Allah concerned only to oppose Christian heresies and not Orthodox Christianity if the latter was an even greater threat to Islam? I mean, why deal with the sideshow rather than the main act? Now, of course, if the Quran was actually composed by Muhammad, who could well have come into contact with unorthodox Christians, thinking that they actually represented Christianity, it wouldn't be at all surprising to find these sorts of claims reflected in the Quran. But that would be just to concede that the Quran isn't the word of God. It was just written by some uh, 7th century Arab, maybe Muhammad, maybe, maybe someone else. The simple fact is that the Quran shows no evidence that its author had any familiarity with the New Testament or had any reliable understanding of New Testament Christianity and basic Christian Doctrine. And remember, you know, this is long after the Council of Nicaea, uh, the Council of Chalcedon, where issues like the Trinity and the Incarnation have been hammered out by Christians. It was understood what Christian orthodoxy was. But the Quran, for example, shows no awareness of the teachings of the Apostle Paul, or even the existence of the Apostle Paul. Now, if its author were merely a 7th century Arab, with limited exposure to Christianity, that would be quite explicable. But the Quran claims to be the word of God. God would know what Christians actually believed and taught, would he not? Even if God were not a trinity, he would at least know what the doctrine of the trinity was, wouldn't he? So this gives us a second reason not to trust the Quran over the Bible. Here's the third reason. The Quran undermines itself by both affirming and contradicting earlier scriptures. As I noted earlier, Orthodox Islam recognizes other scriptures than the Quran. One of the five core beliefs of Islam is belief in the books, plural. Not just belief in the book, but belief in the books. The Quran is the last of these books and it is held to be the final revelation because it was the book given to Muhammad who is taken to be the last of the prophets. The Quran refers to Muhammad as the seal of the prophets. The seal when you close things off. Okay. So the Quran is the last of these books but there are other books and the Quran itself refers to some of these books and positively affirms them. Here we have some verses from Surah 3. God, there is no God but him, the ever-living, the ever-watchful. Step by step, he has sent down the scripture, uh, sent the scripture down to you, prophet Muhammad, and uh, with the truth, confirming what went before. He sent down the Torah and the gospel earlier as a guide for people, and he has sent down the distinction between right and wrong. Those who deny God's revelations will suffer severe torment. God is almighty and capable of retribution. 
So the Quran itself recognizes his earlier books, including the Torah and the Gospel. What's more, the Quran says that the later scriptures confirm the earlier scriptures, and that you can judge that the later scriptures are valid by comparing them with the earlier scriptures. Specifically, the Quran invites Jews and Christians to judge the revelation of Muhammad by their own scriptures, by their own books. Consider these verses from Surah 5. We sent Jesus, son of Mary, in their footsteps to confirm the Torah that had sent, been sent before him. So he's confirming the message of Moses. We gave him the gospel with guidance, light, and confirmation of the Torah already revealed, a guide and lesson for those who take heed of God. So let the followers of the gospel, that is the Christians, judge according to what God has sent down in it, the gospel. Those who do not judge according to what God has revealed, the lawbreakers, we sent to, to you, Muhammad, the scripture with the truth, confirming the scriptures that came before it and with final authority over them, so judge between them according to what God has sent down. Something similar uh, later on in the same surah. If they, uh, referring to the people of the book, which is understood to be the Christians and the Jews, if they had upheld the Torah and the gospel and what was sent down to them from their Lord, they would have been given abundance from above and from below. Some of them are on the right course, but many of them do evil. Messenger, proclaim everything that has been sent down to you from your Lord. If you do not, then you will not have communicated his message and God will protect you from people. God does not guide those who defy him. Say, this is the key uh, text here, people of the book, you have no true basis for your religion unless you uphold the Torah, the gospel, and that which has been sent down to you from your Lord. But what has been sent down to you, the prophet, from your Lord, is sure to increase many of them in their insolence and defiance. Do not worry about those who defy God. So we can see here that the Quran positively affirms the scriptures given to the Jews and to the Christians. The problem, however, is that the Quran also contradicts the, teaching, the teachings of those earlier scriptures in a number of ways. For our purposes, the most significant contradiction is what the Quran says about the identity of Jesus, insofar as it denies to clear New Testament teachings, the crucifixion of Christ, and the divine sonship of Christ. Here's the Quran's denial of the crucifixion, at least almost universally held to be saying that. The Jews said, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, though it was made to appear like that to him, to them. Muslims have debated exactly what that means, but... In any case, they agree that uh, the crucifixion is being denied here. Those that disagreed about him are full of doubt with no knowledge to follow, only supposition. They certainly did not kill him. God raised him up to himself. God is almighty and wise. So there you have the crucifixion denied. Uh, and then later in the same surah, surah 4, 171, people of the book do not go to excess in your religion and do not say anything about God except the truth. The Messiah, son of Mary, Jesus, son of Mary, was nothing more than a messenger of God. His word directed to Mary, a spirit from him. So believe in God and his messengers and do not speak of a trinity. By the way, it's interesting, this, this translation that I'm using here, it's a translation by a Muslim, but it's a pretty good one into English. Actually, what the text says literally here is, do not say three do not say three, which fits with what we saw earlier, this perception that Christians believe in three gods. And that's been glossed over by this translation by putting the word Trinity in there, glossing over the fact that actually the Trinity is being, or Christian beliefs are being mis misrepresented. But anyway, it says, do not speak of a Trinity. Stop this. That is better for you. God is only one God. He is far above having a son. Everything in the heavens and earth belongs to him, and he is the best one to trust. So on the one hand, we see that the Quran affirms the earlier scriptures, while on the other hand, it contradicts them. Now, how do Muslims respond to this problem? Well, they have a standard response, and it's this. The earlier scriptures have been corrupted. The earlier scriptures have been corrupted. 
Specifically, they will say they have been corrupted by the Jews and the Christians themselves. They corrupted their own scriptures. And this corruption is what gives rise to these contradictions between the Old Testament and New Testament and the Quran. Now, on the face of it, that solves the problem, doesn't it? I mean, it would explain the contradictions if you'd corrupted the earlier scriptures. But actually, it's a very unsatisfactory and ultimately indefensible response. In the first place, we have to ask, What kind of corruption was it? What kind of corruption was it? Did the Jews and the Christians corrupt the actual text of the scripture? Did they actually change the words in the manuscripts that they had? Or did they only corrupt the meaning of the scripture? So the text is the same, but they're saying, oh, you should interpret it differently. We're changing the meaning of it. Historically, both positions have been been defended by Muslims. Some argue that they, they changed the actual text, others that they only change the meaning of it. The earlier, the medieval Muslim theologians generally argued that only the meaning of the scriptures had been corrupted, not the actual text. And they had very good theological reasons for saying that, as we will see shortly. But the problem with that idea, that only the meaning of the text has been changed, is that we can examine the Old Testament and the New Testament for ourselves. We can apply proper principles of interpretation, and we can see that they simply do not agree with the Quran. Attempts by Muslims to interpret the New Testament, to interpret the Gospels in a way consistent with the Quran, are exegetically indefensible. That is to say, they're clearly changing the meaning themselves to fit the Quran. It's not actually what the text says on any natural reading. So that that option uh, isn't... Uh, isn't a a good one. But what about the alternative view, the view that the actual text was corrupted? Well, the problem with that view is that we have complete or near-complete New Testament manuscripts that have been dated to centuries before Muhammad. We have a number of them, uh, quite famous ones. The Codex Sinaiticus from the 4th century, Uh, Codex Vaticanus from the 4th century, The Codex Alexandrinus from the 5th century. These are very famous, very valuable, very important manuscripts, or near near complete manuscripts that we have from the New Testament. Two of these, uh, the Codex Sineticus and the Codex Vaticanus, can actually be, uh, sorry, and the Codex Alexandrinus can be viewed online. You can go on the internet and view these for yourselves. We also have the Dead Sea Scrolls for the Old Testament that are dated to the time of Christ or earlier, certainly much, much before uh, Muhammad, that allow us to confirm that the actual text has not changed since from before the time of Muhammad. So we have historical, solid historical evidence that the Jewish and Christian scriptures have been faithfully preserved since well before the time of Muhammad. And that gives rise to a second question that we can pose to the Muslim. When did this alleged corruption take place? If these earlier scriptures were corrupted, when did that take place? Did it take place before or after the giving of the Quran? Well, it could not have taken place after for the reason that I just gave. Uh, We have full manuscripts dating from centuries before Muhammad. We know that they are the same today as they were before the time of Muhammad. But if Muslims say that these earlier scriptures were already corrupted by the time of Muhammad, then why on earth would the Quran instruct Jews and Christians to judge according to their own scriptures in his day? What sense would it make for Allah to say to Jews and Christians in the day of Muhammad, judge according to your own scriptures if those scriptures had actually been corrupted, unreliable, untrustworthy. The texts in the Quran that I I read just a moment ago actually presuppose that the other scriptures were not corrupt in Muhammad's day because people appointed to them to judge, make judgments about Muhammad's own message. It seems that actually Muhammad or whoever wrote the Quran actually thought that these scriptures would agree with what he was saying. That's why, why we find these claims made. And that is not the only difficulty faced by 
Uh, this standard Muslim response to the contradictions between the Bible and the Quran, that the, the early scriptures have been corrupted, because we can ask a third question, a third important question. Is it possible, in principle, for Allah's revelation to be changed and corrupted? Is that even possible in principle, for Allah to reveal something and for it, for it to become changed and corrupted? It's a yes or no question, right? Well, if the Muslim answers yes... Well, that's very problematic, because the Quran itself seems to teach otherwise. In Surah 6, we're told, no one can change his words. He is the all-hearing, the all-knowing. And in Surah 18, uh, follow what has been revealed to you of your Lord's scripture. There is no changing his words. And there are other <coughs> verses that we're told, no one can change his words. No one can alter his words, precisely because he's almighty. And this is his own word. What's more, if Allah's revelation can be changed and corrupted, well, it follows that the Quran could have been changed and corrupted as well. That would further undermine its trustworthiness. So once you start saying that God's revelation can become uh, uh, badly corrupted so you can't tell its message anymore, well, that, that um, impeaches the Quran as much as anything else. On the other hand, if the... If the Muslim answers, no, Allah's revelation cannot be changed or corrupted, well then the earlier scriptures given to the Jews and the Christians cannot have been changed and corrupted. If they were genuine revelations, as the Quran says, then they cannot have been changed and corrupted. And that means that the Quran cannot be a divine revelation after all, precisely because it contradicts those earlier scriptures. So, you see, whichever way the Muslim goes in trying to defend this answer, they're caught. They, they reach a dead end that ends up undermining the Quran again. So I hope you can see then that there's no good way to reconcile the claim that the Bible has been corrupted with the historical evidence that we have and with the teachings of the Quran itself, both in terms of the internal coherence of the Quran and the external manuscript evidence that we have. It all points to the integrity of the Bible rather than the Quran. So to recap, we have three good reasons not to trust the Quran over the Bible. First, the Quran is far more realistic about the human condition than the Quran. Therefore, we should trust what it says about the solution to our basic problem. Second, the Quran misunderstands and misrepresents what Christians believe. It claims to be a, di a divine revelation, but God would at least know what the New Testament writers actually claimed about Jesus and what Christians actually believed. That's not the picture we get. And thirdly, the Quran undermines itself by both affirming and contradicting earlier scriptures. It invites Jews and Christians to judge according to their own scriptures, but it also makes claims inconsistent with those scriptures. In short, the Quran is very much what we would expect of a book written by a fallible man or group of men living in Arabia in the 7th century with very limited knowledge and understanding of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So here's the bottom line. If God has truly spoken to us, if God has truly spoken to us through inspired scriptures, the Bible is simply the only credible candidate. If it's not the Bible, we don't know what it is. Okay? But we do know it's the Bible for the reasons that I gave earlier. Well, that completes my uh, presentation, but I also want to make a, a, a book recommendation to you because I realize a lot of you probably have follow-up questions, you want more information on this. The absolute number one go-to book on this is a book by James R. White called What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Quran. It was just published um, earlier this year. Okay? And uh, some people have called it a game changer in Christian Muslim apologetics. It's, it's superb, very scholarly, very well research, uh, researched. Um, I, I wish I'd written this book. <laughs> you know, it's one of those books. I wish I'd written it. But, um, yeah, he's far more qualified, uh, has done much uh, debating, engaging with Muslims, know what they believe, studied the Quran, and uh, I, I commend that book to you. I don't receive any commission. Okay? I just want to put the best resources in your hands. So.